Hey, welcome to the One Year Bible Journey, especially for beginners. I'm Pastor Kerry, and this is the Growing in the Gospel YouTube channel. We're starting a new project as we begin a new year. I don't know if you're watching this video at the beginning of a new year, but I'm making it for the new year. And it's a one-year journey that you've clicked into. And I'm really excited about the journey before us, and I'm glad that you're taking it. So the first thing I want to say is breathe deep, catch your breath. This will not and should not become a stick that you use to beat yourself with. I have started many, many one-year Bible reading programs in my 47 years of following Jesus. Some of them I have completed, most of them I have not, but you know what? All of them were helpful. And so I want to take care of a little bit of kind of upfront business, organizational kind of things to get us started. And, uh, and then we're going to start our journey together, and I hope you'll invite friends and others to come along with us. At the end of our journey, we're going to have 104 videos, 52 based on Old Testament readings, 52 based on New Testament readings. And the goal is that by the end of this year, we all have a much deeper and broader and richer sense of the entire narrative of God's Word and His message to us. This is going to change your life. It's changed mine before. I know it's going to change mine again. I can't wait to share with you all the ways that God has impressed his word into my life and is still impressing his word into my life. So a couple of things to get started. First of all, I want to encourage you to get a good study Bible. Now, whether this is a physical thing or a software thing, it's totally up to you. Uh, there's a couple that I have physical copies of. I got this when my parents gave it to me when I was a teenager. This is the Ryrie Study Bible. That has served me very well in my lifetime. This one is my favorite. It's the Life Application Study Bible. And this is available in software as well. I have this on all of my Bible study softwares. But if you're not wanting to invest money, and you don't need to, by the way, I will just tell you there's a software that I have on my phone. Uh, it's the icon that's right here. It's called the Faith Life Study Bible, and it is free. Just go to your app store, look up Faith Life Study Bible, and you can download that from the good people at faithlife.com, which is a tremendous source of am amazing a breadth of resources. You can set this Bible software up to have the, the scripture text. You can split the window pane. And you can have the commentary at the bottom. You can resize it all. You can track along with the study notes. It's just a good resource to have. Um, or maybe something to physically take notes on. Also, you could use websites that are free, like Blue Letter Bible or Bible Hub. There's many, many others. And so get your hands on a good study Bible or a good way to take notes as we track through this. Second thing I want to tell you is we're doing this week by week. I've tried daily Bible reading plans, and my journey along the way has been hit and miss on the day-to-day -day stuff. And I, if, I'm for it. Like, I read my Bible most days, and I hope you do too. I'm just not legalistic about it. If you miss a day or two, it's not the end of the world, and you shouldn't quit the journey, okay? You should just stay on track on some way and somehow. And for me, thinking of it in 365 chunks, it's like, okay, am I really going to be able to stay on track? But if I think of it in weak chunks, it's only 52 chunks, and we can do that. So you can do this, okay? Uh, like I said, you don't need to turn this into a stick to beat yourself with. Even if you miss a week, I want to encourage you to stay along the journey. The next thing I want to say is you can approach this in one of two ways. You can decide you're going to read every line, every word, every text, or you can decide you're going to read some and you're going to survey some. However you tailor this to your needs, it's good, okay? It's good. Like, if you don't read the whole Bible, if you survey the whole Bible with us, you're still going to be so much further down the road spiritually in your walk with the Lord and in your understanding of his message to you. And, you know, um, following Jesus, if there's anything I've learned over 47 years, it's a long, long, long runway. It's a long journey. It's a long growth curve. So we have to give ourselves the same grace that he gives us. We have to bask in the same mercy that God offers us. And we have to take the journey one step at a time. So if you miss a day, you miss a week, you miss a reading, 
um, try to at least stick with the videos because uh, one week, one, once a week on Monday, there'll be an Old Testament discussion. And then once a week on Tuesday, there'll be a New Testament discussion that will set you and keep you on track with the unfolding drama and the narrative as we go through the year. Listen, don't make this a new burden to carry. Uh, your transformation, your growth, your formation is God's work. You are God's workmanship created unto good works. This is not a new burden for you to carry or a new uh, a new opportunity to fail as a Christian, okay? That's not where we're going. Just enjoy the journey. And that's why I'm saying catch your breath, okay? it's This is not a mountain you're going to climb. This is a grace you're going to soak in. You're going to bask in. This is a joy and a, and, a, and a transformative journey you're going to partake in. Think of this like a buffet. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, and I don't do this very often, but when I do, I really enjoy it. I love to go to a really good food buffet. This past week, my wife and I discovered a new Korean barbecue, and it's all you can eat. And I love Korean barbecue, and I love all you can eat. And I can't do this very much because it would not be good for me. Uh, But when I do, I love to hold my appetite and wait and go and have a great eating experience. Can I encourage you to look at Bible study, look at learning the Bible, look at this journey that we're going to do together as a non-burdensome experience. Look at this as a buffet that you get to bask in. It's not an achievement. You're not trying to impress God. He's already impressed with you. He's already set his love and his grace upon you. He's already inviting you into all of his love and all of his grace through the gospel. So you're not going to impress God if you finish this journey, but you sure will feast a lot along the way. What does God say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. So if there's one thing we're going to take away from this journey over 52 weeks, it's that God is good. And we're going to soak in that goodness. We're going to taste that goodness. We're going to grow in that goodness. So don't turn this into a stick to beat yourself with or uh, an accomplishment to measure yourself by. That's not the point. Just enjoy the journey without guilt, without shame, Take in the word of God and let him grow you. And simply, uh, finally, don't underestimate the power of any part of this journey and every part that you do partake. And don't underestimate the power of even listening to a week's reading if you're getting a little behind. Uh, open the app. You can go to the uh, the Bible app, the Uversion app. You can uh, open up the reading. You can click play. You can even speed it up. <laughs> And listen to it a little faster if you'd like to. When you come to a passage that's hard to comprehend as we go through this journey, I'll tell you what I do Uh, over the years. I have found, now I trust uh, one version more than all the others, but I use two or three. I trust the authorized version more than all the rest, but I will often have a place that's hard for me to understand, and I will quickly turn to the ESV or to the NLT and often both, and I'll contrast and compare Uh, Again, that's helped me, just in all honesty, to help me understand uh, parts of the Bible that are a little dense, a little thick, a little bit verbose, or a little bit the syntax is maybe maybe I struggle with. Um, And so that's a little bit about getting started on the journey. Now I want to spend the next few minutes just giving you an overview of the Bible itself. Let's ask some really big questions before we start the reading for this journey. And by the way, your reading assignment for this week is Genesis 1 through 15 in the Old Testament. Tomorrow we'll talk about the New Testament. So you got 15 chapters ahead of you as we open God's Word, the Bible. And you can click on the link in the bottom or the description of this video, and you can download the reading assignments in a PDF form that will show you the entire year, one week at a time. And big shout out to my friend Nick Minerva for creating that chart, and thank you for letting us use it uh, in our church family and now on Growing in the Gospel. So what is this thing that we call God's Word? What is this thing that we call the Bible, this intimidating? I mean, look how thick. You ever read anything that thick? It, it can be intimidating. But let's break it down and let's look at the high view. First of all, there are 66 books, but it's one book. This was compiled and written over 1,600 years. We believe every word of it was inspired by God through 40 different human authors. 
It was given in three different languages. It was written on three different continents, like I said, over a period of 1,600 years. And this is what is so supernatural about this book. It is one cohesive story. That's a miracle. What I just said is a miracle. 66 books, 1,600 years, 40 authors, three languages, three continents, one story. And what that tells us about this book is it is absolutely supernatural. I'll tell you another thing that that would be absolutely convincing to me, if nothing else, and that would be that about 30, a little less than 30% of this book is prophetic. It tells the future. And of the prophecies that it, about 50% of those prophecies have already come to pass. And those prophecies have been fulfilled with 100% accuracy. So this, this is a, this is not just any book. This is not just human literature. This is not just historical literature or classical literature. No, this is a supernatural book. It was given to us by a supernatural mind. No human being could make this up. No men could just contrive this story and nobody could predict the future with 100% accuracy as this book does. Now, when you take that introduction, you come away with one word, supernatural. This book is alive. It is supernatural. When you experience it, you know that because it's transformational. It changes you from the inside out. It reads you more than you read it. And then you know it's supernatural. But when you just look at the objective reality and the facts— This is a supernatural book, and it tells us a story. Now, I'll tell you, we're going to talk a lot about that story in the days ahead. It's a layered story. It's a nuanced story. It's a very dense story. And yet it's also a simple story. I like to use Lord of the Rings as an illustration. If I said I want to tell you a simple story, uh, it's called Lord of the Rings. It's about a hobbit, a hobbit who gets a ring and throws it into a mountain and saves the world. Now, if you've read the book or seen the movies, you would laugh at me because you would think, wow, that is simplification, but it's radical simplification (laughs) because the Lord of the Rings is much more nuanced and dense and layered than that. Well, when you come to the Bible, you're coming to a story. It is most essentially, and we'll talk about this, a story. It's, It's God's grand story. And it is simple. We can tell the story of the Bible in four words, creation fall, redemption, restoration. And I want you to maybe write those down, keep them with you because we're going to keep coming back to those. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. The whole Bible in four words, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. But it's much more complicated and nuanced and layered than that. And so it's the kind of story that when you read it for the very first time, you'll understand a lot of it. It will captivate you. It will transform you. But It's really designed to be read throughout the rest of your journey because you'll never exhaust its depth or its beauty or its mystery. And every time you read this story, it will change you all over again. You'll see things you never saw before. You'll understand it in ways you never understood it. So let me talk for a few minutes about what the Bible is not, okay? It's not most essentially, and key words most essentially, it's not most essentially a book of instructions or moral behaviors. Now, there's plenty of instruction plenty of behavioral admonitions in this book. But if we look at it just as a book of instruction, we're going to ask the wrong questions and we're not going to really understand it. Most people approach the Bible asking this right out of the gate, asking this question, what do I do? They look at it as a self-help manual. And so the only question they're asking the Bible is, what do I do? And that is a question to ask the Bible, but it's not the first question to ask the Bible, okay? You don't want to come to the Bible with a predisposition or a a presupposition of this one question, what do I do? Because there's a lot of the Bible that will absolutely confuse you if that's the only question you're asking. We'll come back to the questions we need to ask. But understand this, this is not first and foremost a book of instructions or moral behaviors. It's not most essentially a manual for virtue or self-improvement. Now, reading this book will make you a better person, but that's not the, the goal of this book. It's not a topical textbook or encyclopedia for the solving of all of your life problems or the improving of yourself. Thirdly, the Bible is not essentially or most essentially a book of judgment or wrath or punishment. Now, there's some, you know, judgment is unpacked in this book. Wrath is unpacked in this book. 
punishment is definitely a part of this book. There's some negative uh, diagnostics in, in, in the Word of God, but it's not most essentially a dark book. It's actually most essentially good news. We'll come to that. The Bible is not essentially or most essentially a book of rules or guidelines of how to be accepted with God. And it's not most essentially a book of inspiring or heroic stories or myths or legends or fables or inspiring, you know, epithets or or examples to follow. No, in fact, if you approach the Bible as a book of rules or requirements or examples to follow, it will just crush you. It's a wall you run into. It flattens you. It won't inspire you. It will actually make you angry at God because of his demands being so high and so um, unattainable. So the Bible is not these things. It's not most essentially about you or me or what we should do. That's why the first question is not, what do I do? Okay. Uh, The Bible is not most essentially for our personal or social problems. That's why I say it's not most essentially about us. The Bible does not most essentially answer all of our questions. You know, in fact, as you read the Bible, you're probably going to come up with more questions than it answers. But the Bible does answer the most essential questions. The Bible answers the questions we need to know, not the questions we want to know. God's Word gives us the message we need, not the message we want. And there's a lot of mystery to it. There's a lot of questions that God does not answer. He, for many In many ways, he says, trust me now, you'll understand more later. That's so much of the storyline. Now, what is the Bible? Now that we've decided what it isn't, what is it? It is most essentially God's historical redemptive narrative. I like to say it this way. It's a redemptive historical narrative. I like those words. It is a narrative. It's a story. It has a beginning and an end. And it has a happy ending, by the way. And at the beginning of the story, God, you have a perfect God, creating a perfect creation and a perfect humanity to live in that creation. And you have a perfect relationship between them. And then everything goes terribly wrong. And at the end of the story, you have a perfect ruling and reigning God who has redeemed and recreated a perfect creation. And he has rescued and redeemed a perfect humanity who are given new hearts and new lives in a new heaven and a new earth and a new eternity under the kingship of Jesus forever and ever and ever. That's the beginning and that's the end of the story. And everything in between is God's redemptive narrative. A beginning, an end, a happy ending, God's redemptive narrative. This means, and this is very important, the Bible is most essentially good news, not good advice. The reason I say not good advice is it's not about self-improvement. Now, the outcome is that you'll be a growing, transformed um, you'll be becoming a new person. And so, yes, you will become be becoming more like Christ and a better person. But the goal of the Bible is not simply self-improvement. Again, if we go at it that way, we'll miss the big narrative, the big picture, and the big heart of God. But the Bible is good news. Good news is uh, is different than good advice. Good advice is basically, here's how to save yourself. Good news is, here's what's been done for you. Here's how how you can be saved. Here's how you can be redeemed. Here's how you can experience the happy ending that God has in mind. Good news is what's been done for you. Good advice is what you do for yourself. The word gospel means good news. And we're going to see the gospel all throughout Scripture. The implications and the principles of the gospel are in every story on every page. So the Bible is most essentially God's redemptive historical narrative. The Bible is most essentially good news, good news, even the bad news, we'll read plenty of it, even the bad news points us to the greater good news. Thirdly, and most importantly, the Bible is most essentially about what Jesus has done, not first what I should do. Now, like I said, there's plenty of instructions about what we should do, but that comes after our understanding of what Jesus has done. So the first thing we ask the Bible is not what should I do. The first thing we should ask the Bible is who is God and what has he done? Who is God and what is he doing? So as we open God's word and as we begin this journey, here's the questions you're going to want to be asking as you begin to read. Number one, 
who is God? How is God revealing himself in this story and in this part of the story? Where is God in this story and what is he actively doing? You're going to see that the, the events unfolding historically in human existence, in human history, and you're going to see the hand and the heart of God active and operative in that storyline. You're going to want to differentiate what is simply narrative, God telling us what happened, versus how God feels or how he thinks about what is happening. But you're always going to be wanting to ask, who is God and what has he done? So who is God? What has he done? How does this story reveal the heart, the character, the intentions, the purposes of God? How does the story point to Jesus, who is God, revealed in a human body? God reveals himself first through his word, through this story, second through Jesus. He came as God, revealing himself to us. The word became flesh, John said. So who is God and what has he done? And then the third question we ask is, what should I do because of what God has done. So all of the doing flows from what's been done. I like to say it this way, done comes before do. I wrote a little book about salvation called Done. Why? Because the message of the Bible is first and foremost what God has done for us, why we need him to do it, and why he did it. And then out of that, we can ask the question, how does what God has done change me? How does this shape me or reshape me? How should I live now because of what I've just read and because of what God has done because of who he is? Okay, I hope I'm not losing you. Now, as we begin reading, I want to talk to you about as we open the book of Genesis, because now we're going to talk about our Old Testament reading for the week. When you begin reading any book of the Bible, we want to answer some basic questions. Who is writing? When are they writing? To whom are they writing? And in what circumstances are they writing this part of the book, this part of the Bible? We call that context because context is so critical. Context is everything. And so if you don't understand the context, then you won't understand the message. You won't understand how to apply the message and how that message shapes and changes you. And so who's writing, when, to whom, and in what circumstances? You want to Out of that, be asking, what is the point or the primary message in this writing? What did the first recipients of this writing understand it to mean? And what does that understanding mean to me? How does that apply to my life today? So we really seek to understand context and the meaning as received by the first or the earliest readers, the first recipients. What did this mean to them? I like this line. There's one interpretation, but there's many applications. God's word is not privately interpreted many different ways. No, it means what it means, and it meant that to the first readers and recipients. Now, progressive revelation, the fact that we have more of the story in view, simply means we have a clearer eye on the biblical history of things. So, you know, for instance, the Old Testament characters didn't understand, perhaps, maybe that all the nuances that we understand about Jesus. They understood the principles of the gospel but they didn't yet understand the person uh, of Jesus. We get to see all that in the rearview mirror, so we have a much clearer-eyed view simply because we're later in the narrative. It's kind of like saying somebody that's watched 90 minutes of a two-hour movie understands it better than someone that's only 30 minutes into the same mystery or the same thriller. So we're much further in the narrative. We have a much uh, clearer-eyed view. But We're going to be asking ourselves, what's the point and primary message, and what did the first recipients understand, and then how do I apply that? How does it shape me? What does that mean to me today? All right, so your assignment this week is Genesis 1 to 15. The book of Genesis means beginning. So let's ask this question, who's writing? Moses. Moses writes the first five books of the Bible. When did he write these books? Well, when you think of Moses, think of this. This is about 2,000 years before Jesus, give or take, about 2,000 years before Jesus. And before, wrong, Abraham is 2,000 years before Jesus. Moses is about 1,500 years before Jesus. So forgive me, that's my error. Abraham, 2,000 years before Jesus. Moses, 1,500 years before Jesus. So we are several thousand years into human history when Moses decides to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, 
Deuteronomy, by the direction and by the inspiration of God. Who's he writing to? Well, he's writing to the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, the people of Israel who have been rescued from Egypt out of slavery and are in process, they're journeying to their promised land, the land of Canaan, where they're going to settle and become God's representatives on planet Earth. And so uh, they're in process. Moses is writing these books to a second generation of people. The first generation rebelled against God. We'll, We'll talk about this story later. And they died in the wilderness And there's a new generation that's grown up, and they're going to go into the promised land. Moses is writing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy to get them on track of following God, worshiping him, trusting him, following him, knowing who they are, knowing where they came from, knowing why they're here, and knowing how to follow God going forward. So as you open this book, you're reading about beginnings. You're reading about how it all started. And let me tell you what I love about the book of Genesis. There's so much to love about it. But it answers the five most important questions of our human existence. Everybody should read the book of Genesis because every human heart is asking the same five questions all the time and wanting and needing desperately to answer these questions. And there's lots of philosophies and systems that try to answer these questions. And the postmodern mind simply stops trying to answer these questions. But here's the thing. We cannot live without substantive, objective, valid answers to these five questions. So let me give them to you, and then we'll talk briefly about the stories you're going to read this week, and I'll let you go. The five questions that Genesis answers are, who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? What's wrong with me? And how can I be made right? And in the first 15 chapters of Genesis, God's going to begin to reveal, and in some cases, reveal completely the answers to these questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? What is wrong with me? How can I be made right? So how is God going to answer these questions? Well, who am I? Did I evolve? Am I random? Am I a mistake? No, I'm the creation of God. God designed me. God spoke me into existence. God planned for me to be a part of human history at this point in the timeline. This is God's creation. That's who I am. I'm the creation of God. Where did I come from? I came from the heart of God, the mind of God, for the purposes of God. Why am I here? I'm here for the glory and the pleasure and the enjoyment of God. In fact, I was designed to know God and to be close to him and to relate intimately with him in joyful fellowship. And by the way, don't begin to think that God's glory or God's pleasure or God's enjoyment is in somehow Uh, at odds with yours? No, the fact is God's pleasure is your pleasure. He finds pleasure in you and you can find pleasure in him and he is the height of the greatest pleasure that human beings can experience. When we live knowing him, enjoying him, bringing glory to him, we find our greatest glory. We find our greatest joy and our greatest pleasure and our greatest enjoyment. The whole in our hearts that that nagging low-grade sense of lostness that we can never really get rid of, it's filled, it's flourishing, it's overflowing the moment we're redeemed, the moment we come back into relationship with God. So who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? The fourth question, what's wrong with me? Well, we're going to find out in Genesis 2 and 3. Sin is what's wrong with me. The fall, the rebellion. Uh, I've been banished. I've been separated from God. I'm ostracized. I'm apart from him because I'm sinful. Creation is broken. That's what's wrong with me. That's what's wrong with you. That's what's wrong with everybody. That's what's wrong with the planet. That's what's wrong with everything that's broken about humanity and about human existence and about human history and about all of creation itself. Creation has fallen from God. Creation fall. How can I be made right? And this is the beautiful part of the story. And As I said, the gospel's on every page. The earliest part of the story begins to point us to the fact that though creation has fallen, God is going to redeem. God has a way. He's going to make things right, and he's going to offer us an opportunity to be brought back to him. So Genesis is divided really into two parts, two chunks. The first chapter, first chapter through 11, 1 through 11 is part one. 
and then 12 to 50 is part two. And I want to give you a quick overview of those, and then we'll be done for today. In chapters 1 through 11, we read the sweeping cosmic accounts of thousands of years of global events. It begins with creation, chapters 1, 2, and 3, creation and fall, and the story of Adam and Eve and their family. And chapters 5 and 6 are about the pre-flood civilization and the story of Noah and the building of the ark and the flooding of creation and starting over, God starting over with Noah. So Adam has failed and then Noah fails. And chapters 1 through 11 are these sweeping cosmic events and they cover thousands of years of human history. And there's a lot of mystery to these thousands of years of human history. But here's the important things to know that God made a perfect creation and he is good, but that creation rebelled against him and defied him, first by Adam and Eve, secondly, when you come to Genesis 6, by these beings called the sons of God intermarrying and populating with the daughters of men. Now, there's a bit of conjecture on what that passage actually means. It's either angelic beings figuring out how to hack DNA and procreate with humanity and corrupt God's creation, which is completely plausible when you think about the supernaturality of angels and them being able to take on physical form, or they were human leaders that purported themselves to be descendants of ancient demonic fallen beings that corrupted God's creation. Suffice to say, Genesis 1 through 6, the pre-flood civilization, there's a lot of mystery there. But for God to flood the world and start over with Noah, just think this way. There's a lot more to it than we fully understand. How bad would things have to be for God to wipe everybody out and start over? Pretty bad. Probably beyond our imagination, bad. And so God started over with Noah, but it wasn't long before Noah failed. And then Noah's family sinned and rebelled against God. And pretty soon the planet was back in a state of rebellion against God and trying to unite and create their own, their own creation and, and pushing God out. And one thing is true about ancient peoples in early Genesis, and that is that they all worshiped a serpent God. And that's, by, by the way, documented in secular history. And, uh, and it was a dark, dark time in human history and human civilization. And mankind keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So by the time you get to chapter 11, creation is dark. Things are bad. All of creation, for the most part, has rejected God. There are rare exceptions. Job, Noah, Abraham, possibly others that we don't know about, possibly Melchizedek. And we'll talk about these characters later. But there are exceptions. There are God followers, but for the most part, God's creation has totally rejected him. Now, when you get to chapter 11, and this is exciting, 11, 12, I'm sorry, 12, 13, 14, and 15, you're going to begin the story of a man named Abraham. In chapter 12, the narrative of Genesis moves from this cosmic sweeping view way up close to this intimate portrait of a man named Abraham who's an ancient follower of God. And God, because Abraham knows and loves and worships God and faiths God, God decides he's going to unfold his redemptive plan for humanity and for creation through the family of Abraham. He's ultimately going to save and offer salvation to the whole planet through the family of Abraham. He's going to do this story through this man and his family. He's going to bless this man supernaturally. And what's his goal? His goal is to show himself to the whole world. His goal is so that the whole world will know who is the true God and who are the fake gods so that the whole world can choose him. So we're going to read Genesis 12, 13, 14, the story of Abraham meeting Melchizedek in the valley of Shaveh, which is the garden of Gethsemane. You're going to see the you're going to see that creation falls in a garden. You're going to see that Noah sins again in a garden. You're going to see that Abraham makes a covenant with God in a garden. You're going to see that Jesus sheds his blood 
in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and you're going to see that at the end of creation, we're going to all be enjoying a new garden. So it's pretty cool how the theme of garden traces all the way through Scripture, that God puts man in a garden, man rejects God, man is banished from the garden, Jesus goes to the garden to suffer, to redeem man, and at the end of the story, mankind can be welcomed back into the garden, back to the tree of life, back to the heart of God. It's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. When you come to the story of Abraham, don't get lost in the weeds. God's going to enter into a covenant relationship with Abraham. And chapter 15 is a little bit obscure, but it's the story of God and Abraham cutting a covenant. It's a covenant ceremony, which is what an ancient people group used to do to enter into a relationship. But it's interesting because God puts Abraham to sleep and God cuts the covenant for himself and God cuts the covenant for Abraham. What's it a picture of? It's a picture of the gospel that God is going to enter into the blood of the everlasting covenant by Jesus to be our savior. And he's going to keep your part of the covenant and his part of the covenant. This is why we call it the gospel. Good news. One verse I want to point out to you early, early in the narrative, Genesis uh, chapter three and verse 15, right after the fall, God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Interesting. God says there's going to be a standoff between the serpent, Satan, and the seed of a woman. The seed of a woman, a, a, an individual that will be born not of a human father, but only of woman, Jesus. And God says, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. He says to ser- the serpent, Satan, you're going to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, Jesus. He's talking about the crucifixion. But that seed, that Savior, will crush your head. You will be destroyed. You will be defeated by the work of a Savior that will be born of a virgin. And this goes all the way back to the earliest part of creation. Do you see the gospel? God says salvation is coming right after the fall. He says, my grace, my mercy will be made available. So the story is off and running. This is the first 15 chapters of Genesis. I hope you enjoy the reading. I would love for you to post comments at the bottom and share your insights on the journey. Let's do that as we work through this together. And I look forward to responding and hearing what God is teaching you as you read Genesis 1 through 15 this week. We'll see you next week for the Old Testament portion. We'll see you tomorrow for the New Testament reading.